Well, this creatures, they may live in harmony with their environment. Harmony in the sense that the environment produces something they need and they produce something that the environment needs. The bees need the nectar and so on from the flowers, make honey, just the food for the, um, the community. And the flowers need pollinating. And the bees, therefore, the creatures are the um, they're symbiotic together. Lose the bees, and you lose the plants. Lose the plants, then you lose the bees. There's a cooperative harmony. The herd mm, live on the grass and the herbs that they eat and the manure from the animals nourishes the ground for the plants to grow. Is it the case that most plants grow from the top and if the cattle eat the top then the plant is stunted and diminished and has a hard time. Whereas grass grows from the bottom, cattle can eat the top and the grass keeps growing. So the great grasslands start to develop in place of the mixed flora on the steppes, on the grasslands of the continents, the great grassland areas. We picture bison or cattle or any sort of creature that just lives on grass. Could be the um, the geese, because the creature is hostile to a certain type of environment, the mixed flora, and compatible with the grass environment that develops in its place. Because of the creature's existence and flourishing, it's not quite as good in a sense as the bee situation. Then there's another degeneration, a form of creature that is a predator, a hunter. His welfare turns on consuming the other creatures. The grass supports the herd and the herd support the hunter. But of course if the hunters grow in number the herd would decline. Unless the herd itself has a protective ability in sheer numbers and stampede. In which case the predator can only pick off the strays, waits for the sick and the ill, uh, the isolated ones, and picks them off. And there's a balance, therefore, according to the ability of the hunter and the defensiveness of the herd.
The hunter is faster but for shorter distances, for instance. There are predator nations. Might be the Roman. Might be the English. They're born of predative behavior within the human society. Where leaders feed off the poor, use the poor as a resource, and uh, form a power structure whereby they can cream off um, the surplus of value that poor produce and are left poor by some sort of social mechanism of force. Such societies are very able at um, exploiting the environment too. Land, minerals, fish from the sea, make technologies that contribute to this production of surplus to be consumed by those who have the power to corner it. So we have in the back of our mind that a rural society of, say, herdsmen was freer and less imposable upon because it's so fragmented. It was a family structure of society, not society being one huge family. Lots of little families, nomads, who might settle down to exploit the land and animals more intensively. We have communities of families, villages, because they can be competitive to each other if resources are scarce. We get bigger communities with power structures localized in cities that are aggressive to other communities and, and nomads, of course, exploit anything that can be exploited in the region. So you get city-states. The power center is protected by a wall, castles. Protects the elite of the power center. The sort of Persian Scythian well, before the Persians, but that sort of vast area, Central Europe, Europe, Camasia, and Northern Europe, disaggregated groups of marauding horsemen that will prey on what we call civilized countries nearby raid and steal, basically. Well, pillage and burn, but steal. Seen as the enemies of these other societies, of course.
a dominant individuality that's still an, an enemy of the city-state and nation. So we see the growth of independence, intelligence, individualism is foundationally at odds with environment. It is war. It is desire that drives that becomes conscious of an individualism possibility and imposes accordingly. It uses the environment to some change, some gain. It is aggression. Creatures change from being a herd of contentment to a warring individualism. Ability and contentment are inversely related. If you, you know, pictured if you like by the cow that just sits and munches all day. Compared to the lion that sleeps and then every few days is hungry enough to go and kill. Hunts and kills. And we have the bees that have this incredible cooperative community. But their communities can be war with each other. But power and ability Intelligence developed together. But the needs of the creature remain the same. To survive, to have food. Which is to say to have safety and nourishment. And he may use his intelligence to preserve such, if he realizes that cooperation within his own community is valued, helps towards security. So the exploitation is now the environment, not of the people. But there are limits to the resources of the environment. So he must use his intelligence to regulate his society. Such that his environment continues to feed him the resources he needs through time. If he doesn't manage this, then his society is wiped out by, well, famine, say, shortage of materials for the way his society runs. Whether it's shortage of water, some mineral, ability to grow food on a big enough scale to keep up with an increasing size of his society. Or whether it's even pollution of the air he breathes, 
which means another resource has gone, a necessity. Perhaps, unless he can find a substitute. It becomes reliant upon his technology. His technology is his resource for nourishment and security. He may have changed his environment so much that he's replaced uh, his natural world with a man-made one of houses, cities, roads, plastics, (laughs) Um, whatever. If he gets his technology wrong, or if something happens in his environment beyond his control, you might say it as, you know, a cataclysm of changing weather or um, volcanic eruption or continental shifting, whatever. Um, Then he may find his civilizations wiped out and the whole process of growth starts again. Or starts from some relatively low level of development that's left from the cataclysm. So the limits may be the environment itself, the basic um, structure of the planet, in fact. And its relationship to energy, the sun. And uh, the creature civilization on the planet constantly develops to the point of cataclysm and then starts again. Cycles continuing through time in this sense. You might call this whole view uh, a theory, but it's more just a view. Uh, uh, an observation, a conception of what's going on, rather than a causal explanation of what's going on. We can visualize causal links in the process. In, in, in what generates or causes the cycle. but it's very scant. And um, it's like an extremely poor theory that we'll do for the time being until we have something that seems more comprehensively enlightening as to what's going on and what we might infer could go on could be adjusted, could be changed. And the evaluation of such, whether it would be good or bad to do so. It may be that herds can form incredibly good communities. We look at bees and ants, termites, able to make structures, the beehive and so on, you know, compared to the predator branch, of, it has a lair, a hideout, but even the hideout might be something of a structure, a nest. sort of den. So both have a technology development. One is 
is an isolation power situation. The other is a cooperative community, but still with some sort of isolation to other communities and perhaps hostility. A notion of other not found in the herd. A notion of competition more marked in the predator. This is my territory for hunting, not yours. Predators may fight terribly with each other and they have the wherewithal to do it, of course. Herds in response develop a defensive structure, sheer numbers and stampede and so on. A civilized man is a herd in some sense, and he's got very large communities. But he's a predator towards his environment. He's not necessarily good for it. You know, he clears the, the jungle and the woods and the bush. If he shifts to a, a technology approach, to meeting his needs of um, nourishment and perhaps protection defense against wild animals and against other persons, especially community against community. We see how on a grand scale one nation can impoverish another simply by the armament competitiveness. So we had the Soviet Union having to spend twice the proportion of its national income, national product, on producing defense and war armaments to keep up with the United States and possibly Europe as well. And the society collapsed because of it. A sort of not too cold war that impoverishes one of the parties into oblivion or subservience to the winning party. We see a nation like China developing as a vast middle class of affluent Chinese, you know, over a hundred million of them. But an enormous underclass, of course, of poorer workers, much poorer. You can see it as the middle well, the development of the middle classes uh, that became in the end, you know, industrial communities and so on. Entrepreneurs and technocrats that form the middle class of power. But it still develops into a pyramidal power elite, where the controlling power, in a sense, has to be at the top, and it's of the few. In the modern society, absurdly rich compared to the rest of the population. Even in the not-so-modern society, but modern in its way, wasn't it? like India, the Rajas absurdly rich and the rest of the population very marginal. Tends to that extreme because they are in the very nature of it predatory. 
mintis. Preying upon poor nations, marginal peoples, and therefore especially their own. It's a power struggle. The struggle only seems to be less violent and more peaceful because it's securely established some system of exploitation. It has indeed a power structure that's holding. the rest of the world, if you like, as resources in subjection. But the constraints on power are ever real. The nature and unwieldiness of the planet compared to the power of the power elites, the creatures on it, of the creatures on it. And the nature of the creatures themselves they are temporal. They don't live much at all over a hundred years each, and many of them very few years, especially in positions of dominant power. You know, kings last anything from a few years to, at the most, 40 years, and typically not that more like seven or fifteen years, that sort of thing. So it's not a happiness for the elites any more than for the poor. Although the elites are certainly privileged relative to the poor and subjected nations as well. They've reached their boundary, their frontier, you see, the power elites. is defined by their technology and lack of resources. And they may invest in their technology to extend the boundary. But the boundary will still be there. And the problems are all relative. And the happiness and unhappiness seems to be much the same, which is surprising. And perhaps the salvation of the masses. I was going to say, although this, the masses' life expectancy is much shorter than the power elite, but not necessarily if the power elites are feuding and murdering each other. Mm. Well, you may have got the impression it's a world now just of evil, not good at all. But all life has to have wants that are being satisfied, else it doesn't continue. So the very fact that it's continuing here means that wants are being satisfied at some level. And perhaps the degree of happiness and contentment or discontentment may actually be inversely related to distribution of power. The wandering ascetic has indeed chosen in that case the best option. <laughs> the peasant who works all the daylight hours actually does have the best option. You could say he's beaten into submission. But perhaps he's not striving. And it's the frustration of striving and not achieving that really eats away at the person. 
destroys his character. And his stability. The peasant is incredibly stable. He has a pattern that he just conforms to. It is imposed, that's true. But he's not suffering in a sense the impositioning, the punishments and so on, because he's conforming. Whereas of course the power elites are not conforming with each other. They are competing furiously. The king's enemies are his closest family very often. Just as much as the elites of other nations. In fact, he can have an affinity in a way with empathizing with their situation, <laughs> like his own. But of course kings are ever competitive with each other, even if they're of the same family, which was meant to unite them. Marriages of convenience and political allegiance, valued in terms of strategy rather than happiness. Whereas the peasant family, he meets her needs, she meets his needs. And they have a home of some sort, albeit a hovel. But it's what they're used to, it's what they were brought up in anyway. Whereas a, a powerful person that falls to such a situation may want to just commit suicide, it's just too bad to cope with. The one used to it is just used to it, it's normal living. Of course, if the poor are being used as cannon fodder, well, I mean, hmm, it's hardly satisfactory, is it? But if the poor are protected from wild beasts because of community and so on and control, and crime. Then perhaps their lot is not that much different to the rich. <laughs> Don't know. 